Our Sunday school lesson for today is lesson number three. This is June the 21st, 2015. Our, this is from unit number one, and the topic is God abhors selfishness. Uh, this is taken from our standard lesson commentary, and our devotional reading is Psalms. 119 verses 31 through 38. Our background scripture is the sixth chapter of Amos, and our printed passage is Amos, the sixth chapter, verses 4 through 8, and also 11 through 14. Our key verse is Amos, the sixth chapter, verse 12. And our lesson's aims are to describe that the people, or describe the ways the people of Israel abused the privileges and blessings that were afforded to them, explain why selfishness, greed, and pride are opposite uh, to a godly lifestyle, and our last aim is pretty much a homework assignment for us. It simply says identify one area of selfishness, greed, or pride in our life and make a plan to correct it. So we will briefly look at the background uh, of our lesson. Uh, this period of rain here is uh, from about 790 to 739 BC. Uh, this was during the reign of King Uzziah, and um, also uh, we will see later that uh, this lesson is actually coming. Uh, Amos the prophet is actually the messenger of God, and he's sending a warning uh, to northern Israel. Now, he has already uh, met with uh, Judah, the southern kingdom. Um, we will see that this is during a period of peace. Uh, there was uh, no oppressing nation upon Israel or Judah at the time. Uh, this was a warning to try and offset that which God already knew would take place. So this was a time of prosperity. They had received economic recovery. Uh, as I said, there was no war in the land. Uh, military was in good condition. Uh, yet, um, it's a issue for us to study, to evaluate, that why is it during the time of good that we see the human character and behavior fall to such a state of lowliness. We will see that Amos, uh, through the sixth chapter and the first verse, we notice that Amos had sent a message to Judah as well as Israel, and he had instructed them to go and to look at the other nations, north and south, uh, to see the behavior and to see how blindness had come to these other nations so that they would have a backdrop, a comparison to compare to themselves, to look at their own behavior. And so when we look at the emphasis of this lesson, although uh, much of it is addressed to Israel because now Amos is going to render the message that God has placed upon him to deliver to the Israelites, the northern kingdom. Uh, we still, even though this is uh, years, thousands into the past, uh, we can still make a comparison or we can still attribute the actions, the behavior of the people of that day 
to ourselves, the people of this day. So we will begin uh, by looking at the scripture. There are highlights, and uh, I will want to address three of them. It is indulgent dining. And when we focus on that, it basically we're talking about waste. And I remember our four parents used to have, they had these little one line uh, lessons of life. Uh, and they would voice them among us like declarations. And they would say, waste not, want not. And then we have drunken rivalry. Uh, the practice of uh, some debilitating behavior gets us into very excessive and overindulgence. And then we have selfish indifference, which leads us to another cliche that we often hear, such as, I've got mine, you get yours. It, remo it moves us to a point where we're not concerned as to what is happening to other individuals around us. And so we're going to entertain what the scripture is saying to us uh, from the fourth verse, which reads, that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. And I want to pause right here just to uh, lift what uh, scripture is saying. It's giving us a picture of the elaborate design of the couches uh, that those that are being addressed were resting upon. And it's given us a, a picture of the luxury, uh, how they describe the ivory that was inlaid into the frame and the design of the couch. Now, a lot of times uh, when we look at the things that we have attributed so much value and uh, uh, so much uh, purpose to, um, we don't think many times of the implications or how it affects other elements within our environment, uh, within our society. But when it spoke of the beds of ivory, um, ivory comes from where? It comes from elephants, from the tusk of the elephants. And there were some archaeologists who were doing studies, and they found like 500 fragments, according to the commentary, uh, that had different sculptures with inlaid ivory. And just as it was then, and so as it is now, this uh, uh, filed reports that the source of the ivory was probably from the tusk of Syrian elephants, which today are extinct, gone, which were subspecies of Asian elephants. Now, I am sure that there are probably uh, some reports and documentation from animal rights groups today who are fighting for the cause of elephants over in India and also in Africa, where there is still a large uh, request for ivory. Um, I would believe that if we went to the stock market, we would see that ivory has a nice price tag to it. My point here is, is that while it appears that those are living lavishly, and uh, the lifestyles of the rich and the famous, and we look at things that uh, have a certain appeal to the eye, but how much are we indulging into or investigating into how others are suffering as a result of something that we do 
just as a part of our selfishness and our greed and our pride. So as we're talking about the ivory and the inlay on the bed and how it dressed up and fancied the couch and how we were looking at these things, also how many animals are dying so that we can live richly? And is it worth the slaughter of many just so that I can appear to be as though I have arrived? Also, the text spoke about the types of meats uh, that was a part of those that were dining. It spoke about the lambs and the calves. And this was not just a uh, common diet uh, for the people of Israel at that time. Everybody was not sitting down to lamb chops and steaks. Uh, this was something that those uh, who uh, were living in luxury and lavishly, uh, they were eating the lamb, the fatted lambs and calves. But these were normally reserved for the sacrifices, the sacred sacrifices on specific feast days for the house of Israel. Now, that which once was viewed as being sacred, that which was viewed as uh, presenting and offering unto God for the sins of ourselves, had now become a practice where now we just slaughter them for our own fulfillment. And this was not... Uh, for all of Israel, but this was for the select group. Uh, I would say that we would probably refer to them as the 1% of America who withholds the wealth of the nation. So when we look at these practices, one of the issues that is uh, unfortunate for us is that these behaviors that happen on high, they trickle down to the conduct of those that are low. It is unfortunate that it appears as though this is the bar that has been raised and this is the conduct that has been established. And even though we recognize that it is something that is debilitating for all of us, yet we become consumed by its presence and then we find ourselves following in suit. It doesn't end there though. It goes on to tell us that the chant to the sound of the vial and the in invent to themselves instruments of music like David that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments. So we have uh, another extension of the behavior as we look at them responding to repetitive tones in music form, the chant and then violins and other instruments uh, that are tingling to the ear, uh, we would say sounding brass. But uh, then it goes on to tell us that uh, the behavior doesn't stop there though, that it is increased uh, by the influence of wine and not just drinking out of the normal service cups or glasses or containers, but the overindulgence, that they use bowls uh, so we could increase the influence of our activity. And we still say, although we're talking of an era back 790 to 750, 739 B.C., uh, before uh, they were overtaken by the Assyrians, uh, in around 733 B.C., and then uh, from the king 
uh, Sargon, where they were actually uh, decimated in 722 BC. But although we're talking in past, those behaviors are still current. And as I said earlier, uh, we have TV shows where we uh, refer to them as reality shows. And uh, I remember one in particular, the lifestyles of the rich and the famous. And I don't know if it's still a show that it's uh, on air today or not. I don't know what their ratings were. But apparently, uh, they had developed an audience that wanted to see how the rich and the famous live as though this was normal. And what the lesson is really trying to get us to see is, is that these behaviors, this conduct, these types of activities, these are not to be perceived as though this is normal, as though this is acceptable as though this is pleasing and in accordance with what God expects from us. Now let's go further. It says, but they are not grieved for the afflictions of Joseph. Now Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, the two sons of Joseph, uh, encompassed a large territory of the nation of Israel. Uh, and many times uh, Ephraim and Manasseh are referred to uh, in accordance with speaking to northern Israel. And so, but what it says here is that they were not grieved for the afflictions of Joseph. And I like to read this passage right here. Uh, it says the selfish preoccupation of the wealthy leaders blinds them from being concerned about the affliction of their people. Isn't it something where we see the suffering of groups of people among ourselves? Now these were not uh, foreigners, these were not strangers. Uh, these were people of the same kin. These were all Israelites, yet because of this separation from wealthy to the poor, there is no sympathy towards the suffering of many of the masses. And we still have that characteristic today. That is still present among us. Now, it says that, and this is in the seventh verse, it says, therefore, shall they go captive with the first that go captive, and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. A lot of times it appears as though the uh, disaster or the uh, overtaking of a group of people or the downfall of a society it will only affect uh, those that are already suppressed. But this uh, tells us here, and I want to read this from the commentary. It says, Amos prophesies that the leading citizens who are so self-indulgent will be the first that go into captivity. Conquerors commonly or customarily remove the leaders of the conquered nation to diminish the possibility of later resistance. So many times it appears as though it's going to fall on you, but it's not going to affect me. And that is far from what scripture in this text is saying to us. Let's just look at what verses 8 and then we'll jump to 11 and what it says. Uh, one thing is, is that this will not be bypassed. This will not be offset. Uh, this will not be something that is substituted or delayed. Uh, this is going to take place. 
But because it did not happen at that very moment, the behavior continued. So listen to what verse 8 says. It says, the Lord God had sworn by himself, said the Lord, the God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob and I hate his palaces. Therefore, will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. For behold, the Lord commanded and he will smite the great house with breaches and the little house with cliffs with clefts. When we when we think about this, I like uh, the commentary that says the strongest of oaths is when the Lord swears by himself. The fulfillment is a guaranteed certainty. So it's it's not based upon if uh, we can politically influence a group and uh, kind of buy off their leaders, uh, if we can somehow uh, cause a certain uh, change in the society or what have you, but there are consequences to our actions. And what this is saying is this will not be the court system. This will not be uh, a gathering of United Nations that will decide that uh, there needs to be some uh, retribution or action taken because of the ill treatment of a group of people. But this will be done by God, the power of the creator, God's himself. Now, when we look at uh, what it, I, I like another commentary, I'm just trying to share this with you. It says a person's social economic status would not matter. God was going to punish the great house of the rich as well as the small house of the poor. Although the rich had oppressed the poor, the Israelites at a whole, as a whole had disobeyed God. The injustice was the way of the land. It was so bad that good looked bad and bad looked good. Isn't that a sad commentary on how our society is basically in reverse, where now that which is normal is perceived as being abnormal, and that which is abnormal is considered to be normal. But I wanted to give us uh, a background. Uh, when we think about then why is God so mad at the Israelites? And why does he send his prophets and his messengers to send warnings to them based upon what? What is it that uh, he had required of them to do? Or what is it that they used to do that now they've turned from and no longer do? I wanted to read Leviticus, the 19th chapter. I'm going to begin at the ninth verse. Uh, the subtitle in this here says, The Provision for the Unfortunate. So here, while the text is also speaking about the treatment of the poor, Let's hear what the Lord said in the book of Leviticus, the 19th chapter, and beginning at the ninth verse. It says, when you reap the harvest of the land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord, your God. Now, let's just focus on that just for a minute. Because uh, just a little bit back in our text, I mentioned how it said, although the rich had oppressed the poor, the Israelites as a whole had disobeyed God. And so this judgment was not just coming upon the great houses or those that were wealthy, but it was also coming upon the poor. 
So here, I remember our foreparents uh, used to say when they were down south, uh, they would say that uh, you could travel down the country road and you could go into Aunt Mary's field and you could take the greens that you needed. Or uh, you could go and talk to Cousin Jed or you could talk to Uncle Bill and you could ask them for uh, some of the corn uh, uh, that was in their field. And, and they wouldn't even come out the house and monitor you as you would go to get what you needed because it was understood that you wouldn't take any more than what you needed. You would only take enough for your family's needs. And uh, then they could come to your house and maybe you had some other provisions that they didn't and you would share. And so I think about that when the scripture is telling us that uh, don't wholly take everything in the field out, but leave some of it for the poor and for the strangers. Uh, it said, didn't, it, gleaning means to, to reap all of the fruit and all of the yield that is present. But it said, don't leave the field bare, but leave some for those that are coming behind. After your cup is already full, after God has already provided all that you and yours need, then why shouldn't we take from those provisions that God has given to us to make a way for someone else? And this is uh, what is had been spoken and decreed into the civil law of Israel that should be done. But we see now in a, in a period of time where they were prosperous, that they, they were not sharing the full harvest of their field with one another. It goes on and it says that you shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Um, here again, it says that we shouldn't steal. Uh, we shouldn't lie. Oh, isn't that the normal occurrence of the day? So even though we would love to point our fingers at those in high places and in uh, prestigious positions and identify and discredit what they do and say, well, you know, all them politicians are crooks. Well, you know, all those business people, you know, <laughs> all they're into it is for us to make a buck. And they're all trying to manipulate you and trick you out of your money. But then uh, let's look at our dealings with one another. Are we not practicing the same conduct and behavior of those that are before us? So we have a unfortunate practice here where bad behavior, it trinkles down and it becomes a influential practice, even among those who are suffering from the bad behavior. And wouldn't it be nice if the wealth that was above trinkled down as fast as the in, uh, incorrect behavior if it would trickle down as fast as the incor incorrect behavior, that wealth would be distributed at the same rate as the bad conduct and practices are. Let us go on. I want to close out here. And we're looking here at uh, verse 12. And in your, in your time, uh, if you'll conclude on these uh, scriptures, this is a Sunday school lesson. So therefore, it's for all of us to study and, and grab, grab bits and pieces that the Lord brings to us for our indulgence in his word. I wanted to lift this here, though, because it focuses on how 
we get so engulfed and engaged into things that are unnatural. And because we continue the practice of it, it almost appears as though it should be so. Or it is so. But look at what verse 12 says. It says, shall horses run upon the rock? Will one plow there with an oxen? For ye have turned judgment into gall, which is a poison and bitter, and the fruit of righteousness into hemlock, which also is used as a poison. Now, when we think about this, who takes horses that are used to running out over the open plains in grassed areas and then runs them through mountainous plains where there are uh, different levels and elevations and clefts and rocks and things are not stable. That's an unnatural practice. Just as who would take an ox to plow up a rocky surface? That's an unnatural practice. And it equates that with the justice, judgment, and righteousness. We have turned justice and righteousness into that which is unnatural. We go seeking justice, and what we receive is a bitter response. It uses the term gall, which is bitter tasting. It also uses the word hemlock, which is in association with righteousness. So those that are seeking righteousness instead receive a treatment that is equated with poison. When righteousness is equated or evaluated with that which is dead or causes death, what does it say about our society? What does it say about how we have allowed this wickedness to become normal when it is abnormal? So as we look at this, uh, there's one point that comes to mind that uh, I, I'm going to bring this up and then I'm going to close with this. And, and that is uh, where it spoke of uh, God abhorring the excellency and hating his palaces. And this is speaking of the house of Jacob. Um, a lot of times we are impressed with uh, tall buildings and uh, the mirror images and the glass towers. And this uh, spoke of the uh, fortification of the house of Jacob. And it said that God was not impressed with it. That uh, because uh, they had fortified their boundaries against the enemy, that that didn't impress God. Because that they had these large palaces and they were adorned with gold and ivory and they had the best of lumber and, and uh, all of the ornaments and things that were present, that those things didn't impress God. Because they followed suit because they had a regular practice of what they did according to the feast days and they followed the rituals to the T that that didn't impress God because God looks beyond all of the glitter and he sees the heart. And if I could use this as just a paraphrase, if the heart is not shining, like the glass tower is, if the heart is not as sincere as the practice of following the ritual of the sacrifice on certain days, then if the heart is not right, 
Nothing else impresses God. So as we leave you today with this lesson, I would like to close with this. Identify one area of selfishness, greed, or pride in our life and make a plan to correct it. God bless you and God keep you, as always, is our purpose and our prayer to you. Again, this is Sunday School Lesson 3. It's June the 21st, 2015, Unit 1. Our topic, God abhors selfishness. <laughs>